Today I'm talking to John Maybury, one of our much loved retired clergy. Right, brilliant. <laughs> right, so John, tell me tell me how you became a Christian. Long story. Go, on, go for it, go for it. <laughs> um, goes back right to the beginning. I suppose it means, depends a bit about what you mean by becoming a Christian. Mm -hmm. I suppose it started in one sense, when I was baptised by a Solomon Island priest, dipped completely under the water in a giant clamshell. Wow. <laughs> my parents wanted me to grow up as a Christian, facing to Jesus, knowing that Jesus is my friend and loves me, and which they did in their lives. And so I grew up in that atmosphere. Not perfect, of course, at any home, but we grew up in that way, facing towards him. Um, and I suppose at school, there were school, Christian school teachers who showed me a lovely example of what Jesus could be like. So I learned more from them. Then I suppose at 50, age 15, my confirmation meant a great deal to me. It was a real commitment to Jesus. But at age 16, my best friend at school took me to a Christian camp. Right. And then for the first time, really so clearly, I heard what Jesus did for me on the cross. He died for me on the cross. He, want to, he wants to be my saviour. So I gave my life to him then. So I date my evangelical conversion to then. Right, so was that a, a particular moment? Was there, did it... A particular day, I yes. walked around the grounds with a school, a, he was a schoolmaster, Christian schoolmaster, talking about this and then he led me through the prayer, giving my life to Christ. So did you, I mean, did you feel differently? Not particularly. I was no. a bit disappointed in that. <laughs> Not partic I mean, I was just at peace. I suppose that's what it was. Right, okay. So what, so what was it that sort of, um, did anything change? Because you say you were brought up in a Christian yes. household. So at that point, did things change? Not tremendously, except I knew I had his strength for me. And I knew that more personally and more deeply. I knew that I was more committed, more deeply committed to him. So I could walk with him and he with me. Yes. That was a strength. Yes. So did, I mean, and did that change over the years? I mean, because I was yes. quite young to be sort of yes. that way. Yes, indeed. That, that changed over the years. I'm going into your further question. Um, and uh, I, as I grew up, I went to university. I was helped very much by school friends. I went to university and I read science with a view to teaching science. I wanted, wanted to show that science and religion, science and, and religion not against each other, not enemies. So how, how do you, I mean, because that's a, that's a big question, isn't it? Big so, question. Um, so. but I wanted to try and show that it was worth ours. They, were, they could be friends and they could be colleagues, they could be partners together in the search for truth. That was the idea. But on the way, God uh, had other plans. So <laughs> there, there were wise Christian friends who said to me, um, have you considered ordination? So they could see something I couldn't see. And I said, no, never. Uh, but uh, they said, and th I then remembered what my house martyr at school had said um, at the age of 15, like for my confirmation talks. If ever you hear the call to ordination, listen carefully. <laughs> oh, right. So I've forgotten that completely, put it away, but it came back. Um, and so I went on, but I agonised. I remember lying flat on my face in the chapel at night, crying, saying, I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't possibly live up to that. But in the end, he got me. <laughs> but Beverly and I made sure we had our marriage first, six months before right. ordination, so we could go into it together and tackle this big challenge together. Yes. So that must be quite a decision. I mean, so who did you talk to about that? Um, various friends on the way, trusted friends, clergy friends, non-Christian friends. Um, yes, very various friends I talked to. So would you like say, that. because you said, you know, God had plans for you. Yeah. So, but you didn't hear the voice of God. No, I didn't, not like that, no, no, no. I, look, I think so, a wise man once said, you can't actually see what God's about until you look back over your life. Right. I think you understand, looking, looking back, you understand what, how he was working. So various things pile up, don't they? Friends say something, friends yes. question something. So you heard the voice of God like through a conduit through... I, I think, through, I think right, <coughs> right the way through my life, I would say I've met Jesus most really in people. Yes. I think that's what the incarnation means. God comes as a human, mm. and therefore we are going to meet him in, 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 in humans mostly. Yes. So, I mean, you, you've had a long life. I mean, you know, you've 
been brought up as a mm-hmm. Christian anyway, then at the age of 16 you decided to, you know, to commit. So what's, what's it been like being, you know, walking with Christ all that time? How old are you now? I'm 90, I was 91 last week, not, not Sunday, yeah. last Sunday week. <laughs> and uh, very thankful to, to be alive when so many friends aren't or are not with, with us in their mind or body. Um, a roller coaster. <laughs> lots of ups and downs, lots of strains, lots of failures, lots of denying him. But constantly the, the hound of heaven gets at you and, the, yeah. and he brings you back. Tell, tell me about that, about you, deny, you know, denying him. Well, at various ways I've denied him, I suppose, by not honouring people, not respecting people in that way, letting him die in that way. Right. And so have you had doubts? Oh, I had doubts. I think I've often said in sermons, doubt is an essential part of faith. <laughs> <laughs> often have doubts. I mean, I, I've got to, an, it's not, I'm not alone in this, I know. I've got to an eight o'clock on a Sunday, at the start of a long, busy day, and at, at, up front, and I've said, what's this all about? Mm. It's a complete waste of time. You ask yourself questions, of course you do. I think you're a thinking person, and you see the world as it is with so much suffering and so on, and pain in it, and so much selfishness. And actually, seeing all that brings you back to the fact, the need for the gospel, yes. the need for Jesus to come and work with him in the healing of the world. Yes, and so, I mean, do you, well, obviously you do, but explain sort of a relationship with God. Off and on. <laughs> um, Sorry. Hot and cold. Right. Um, forgetting him sometimes, but mostly just aware that he's around with me, in me, as he says. The kingdom of God is within you. Yes. And so uh, just, just being aware that you're, it's like the air we breathe in a sense. You almost take it for granted. I think you can take him for granted in one sense, but in other sense I found I've had to each day, I, well I picked up years ago what Martin Luther once said, I need to be converted every day, I need to be turned to face Christ every day, right. and that's absolutely basic for me I think, and I need, if I don't do that then I'm really I'm off kilter. Right, and how about prayer, I mean has that made a difference to you? Yes, not very good is it? <laughs> um, I try and pray from life. I think very often the news, media, TV, paper, whatever, or the local news of people in the parish and so on, provides you the, the source of prayer um, for people. Prayer basically, I suppose, that God's kingdom will come, his rule of love will deeper and deeper in my life and my life of my family, friends, the whole world. That's a basic prayer, helped by the news, the lists, the parish list, the diocesan list, all the other things that come up. Right. Um, but I think I, I, uh, I like best the old reminder, and it comes back to me every now and again, of the nurse who said, my life, my work is my prayer. So I pray as I work, looking at my hand, and I pray first for those nearest to me, my nearest and dearest, my thumb. I pray then for those who point, those who teach, those who lead in the media and so on, who point people the way. I then point, pray for the high ups, the, the Queen, the government, all those in responsibility across the world. I pray for the weakest folk, that's the weakest finger, those who are ill and poorly and needy and neglected, and those who are trying to care for them and heal them. And lastly I pray for my, the, the little one, myself, that I might be true to God. That's lovely. I, I like that as a, as a way a, of thinking about it. It's a lovely simple one. Yes. It reminds me. So you were brought up in a Christian household, so how did that affect the way you brought up your own children? Yes, very much, I suppose so. Um, the omissions as well as the, the good bits. Um, my father was a very busy doctor, he was out a great deal, so it was my mother who did most of the bringing up. And we never went to Sunday school. We were always taken to church by my mother. Right. Um, which may not have been appropriate in some ways, but at least we knew it was important to her. And that actually, that was, it was more important than what she said, do. No, don't go to Sunday school, come with me. That was an important thing about, I learned that lesson about parenting. It's right. actually the example that matters. And in teenage, you find that, don't they? When they get to the teenagers, you actually find that it's your example that actually matters the most. Definitely, <laughs> absolutely. So did your, your children 
sort of just accept and just follow you or were they oh no no uh, <laughs> they had to obey <laughs> maybe we'll tell you various stories about that um the day when claire who were not going to best to, got to got to i think 16 he said now you said i can be independent from now i'm going to wear my jeans on sunday and i'm not going to go to church <laughs> Fair enough, Fair enough yeah. <laughs> and so on. And they each have their own mo moments of independence, really, growing up. It's actually about finding their own way in the world. Yes. So of our children, two are committed Christians, two don't call themselves Christians, but I'd, I'd say their life was full of Christianity, full of Christian love for other people. Yes. So I don't like labels very much. No. So on that, I mean, do you, do you see yourself as a Church of England person, or is it broader? Minister that? of the Worldwide Church, I think. Right. So I was a baptised into Worldwide Church by a black priest. So, you know, it's to remind us straight away yes. that the world, the world Church is huge. He was just a member of that great company. And I've, therefore, Eco I was chairman of the Ecumenical Council of Portsmouth and so on. I've always worked with other Christians. Right. So, I mean, do you feel there's a, a divide between different sort of aspects of, of the Christian community? Of? Of different, so between Methodists and, and Catholic? Like too much, yeah. still. And we've had steps forward, like, 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 like the whole of life, steps forward, steps backward. We got very near to complete unity with the Methodists in the, in the 70s, and then we just went, went by, the, by the board. We're gradually moving together. The ecumenical movement really has grown. Yes. So I'm very thrilled with that. Um, and I've always been, I was chairman of the Council of Churches in Portsmouth. Because I, I think it's important that all Christians should work together. Yes. It's, one, it's, it's the one Christ. Yeah, definitely. So as a, as a sort of a vicar, or a minute, yeah, because you've been various things within the church, so what have been the challenges for you? Not to assume any privilege I would learn very early on that you tend to, to <clears throat> when you go to s other functions, to be shown the best seat. Uh, and the old thing about Jesus saying, you know, beware when you're being shown to the best seat, you know, get to the back, brother. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And so, and so that's, so how, has, that, has that sort of manifested itself in the way that you live? Sorry, say it again. Has that, has that made a difference to the way you live? Because that's an interesting attitude. Yes, yes, I think so. I try not to be, I mean, I, the dog collar has gone a long time ago for, for many people. And that's probably a good thing. <clears throat> I mean, there are various stories I can tell about the value of a dog collar in certain situations. But in this day and age, I'm sure that the fewer barriers you put up between us, so people don't think we think we're special. Right. We're very ordinary beings. Yes. We're ordinary people, but we're, we're gripped by the extraordinary grace of Jesus. Yes. So, I mean, I'm mean, interested in what you said about, you know, but the dog collar is important. In what way is it? Yeah, yes. How is, how is that important? The, the, we're, we're Wearing the dog collar. Not important at all to me. <coughs> I mean, I've never worried about it. It's there, it's part of the uniform. It's like, like putting on a uniform for parade when you go in front of the. But I'm very happy these days that we're relaxed about this and, and many services don't have robes. Yes. Yeah. I'm happy either way. Sure. So, a big question now. Have you, I mean, how have you seen God at work in your life? I suppose nudging me all the time through Beverly. Yes. <laughs> through daughters, through friends, good friends, who can tell you the truth. Hmm, not sure about that, you know. <laughs> and I, I think that's that's how I find it mostly. Just just bringing me back into line when I've been straying. Yes. Because it strikes me that when when you talk about pretty much anything, God's always there. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, and exactly. God, tell me about that. Not, not consciously. I think it's conscious. And it's, it's like the air we breathe. It's almost, I think it's actually part of the whole, I think he, the spirit, nurtures in you an attitude, an attitude which is going the way of Jesus. So as you go along, somehow you get nudged. And nudges are so important, aren't they? I mean, many of folk, folk have spoke about how important nudges are. Somebody comes into your mind, so I'm too busy to go and visit her now. 
if you don't go now, she's died next week or whatever, you know, yeah, yeah. time and time again I've seen it happen. Now she says, if you do go, it's the right moment for some problem to come up. So it's this thing, being a, trying to be sensitive to the nudges. Not yeah. self-conscious, it, I think it's, you suddenly just become aware. Yes. As you say, it's, it's like the air you breathe, but also it's just part of your blood. I mean, it just... It just it, it's a natural as that, I think, is what happens. Yes, yeah, yeah. definitely. So in, in terms of the future for you, I mean, what, what are your... I mean, you know, because obviously you're, you're mature now in your years. How do you see, you know, the future? I keep, I uh, took part in, and gave a little word at the funeral of the Reverend Beryl Stairs. Yes. Who, who was a lovely friend, a great friend. We used to have, <coughs> reg excuse me, regular meals with her uh, and uh, Ernie. And uh, I said to one of the family then, doesn't heaven get more real as day by day more and more of our friends are there? Mm. And that's that's where we are at the moment, Beverly and I, very much. That will be the next step for us. Hopefully without too much illness yes. and problems on the way. But our daughters have been fantastic at keeping us going as we get a bit, a little bit more needy. Um, less good in our balance, less good in our hearing and sight. Bev is getting very blind now, you know, can't see very much. Yes. So all that is happening. We're getting weaker that way, but we know the Lord's love will come to us and keep us going. Yes. And how do you see, what's your idea of heaven? How do you see <laughs> that? Somebody once said, I don't know anything about the temperature of hell or the furniture of heaven. So <laughs> I don't really. But uh, I love C.S. Lewis's various books, gave various pictures of heaven, yes. didn't they? Wonderful pictures. But I think, I don't know, it's just a world of love, I think. And I think love is the language of heaven. Mm. Because God is love, he's the very centre of it all. Yes. And any, any, anyone we've shared love with will be, will be able somehow to be in touch with. I don't know how it is, but Jesus promises that. Excellent. And so in terms of, I mean, because obviously this is going, I mean, a bit of this will go out into the, the service. And part of it is to say, what would you like us to pray for? So obviously we'd, we'd like to pray for you and Beverly. Um, but are there other things you'd like us to pray for? I think, yes, for patience for us both, as we struggle a bit with the hearing difficulties at the minute, the increasing disability, and particularly Beverly, obviously gets down at times with this blindness coming. And all the plans we're making for the carers are starting to come in now and help us. And uh, to... Um, and also get into a world of sound for her, rather than sight, because she won't yes. have the sight. Yes. So that, that, that's one of the great needs at the minute, I think. If our daughters' patience and strength as they support us in that, <laughs> they'd be absolutely incredible. They each have their own skills, two of them are medical, so they give us lots of lovely support. Excellent. And anything outside of your family you'd, you'd like us as a church to pray for? In the church, for wisdom, for our I mean, thanks be to God, first of all, I have expressed this in some ways, I want to do more to Mike and the church wardens um, and all those who are leading at the moment. It's been fantastic, this lockdown, how St. John's has met the challenge, innovated, new ways of worship. It's wonderful, more people are watching, aren't they, it's sharing by TV. We sit in front of the big TV there and we put the service on there and we share it that way. Um, that, that's absolutely what I've loved is. And for the right decisions to be made in the deanery, yes. because I've, I've seen it before, when parishes are asked to share their vicar, <laughs> it's, it's a bit tough for some people and they, I find it very hard. But in the end of the day, it's got to be about teamwork. It's got to be about sharing. It's got to be that, about that not new, old vision of ministry, which is actually every member ministry. Yes. We're all members of Christ. We all have a part to play. And the vicar isn't the minister is not the only important person at all. Sure, sure. But one final thing I often say to friends, um, Sir Thomas More, Saint Thomas More, to some people, when he was about to be executed, said to his best friend as he left him from his final chat with him, "Pray for me, as I for thee, that we may merrily meet in heaven." I like that. Excellent. <laughs> I've often quoted that. Yes, definitely. <laughs> John, it's been great talking with you. Well, thank you I very really much for your time. This.
So it's, it's been great fun. Thank you, John, very much. God bless you and God bless Beverly.